Well, I am um, from uh, Washington, D.C., as uh, just introduced by them, and uh, I do have a um, uh, favor to ask all of you. I want you to clear your mind of everything except what you hear. Don't worry about your schedule, your business, your family, or your friend. Just focus with me and open your mind. No. Open that. The world that we live in has changed dramatically. And we have transitioned from an industrial age to information knowledge worker age with all of its profound consequences. We today face challenges and problems in our personal life, in our family, and in our organizations that are unheard of only one or two decades ago. And these challenges are not of new order of magnitude. They are altogether different in kind. Now, some of the common challenges we all face today, fear and insecurity. A lot of people today are gripped with a sense of fear. They fear for the future, they feel vulnerable in the workplace, and they're afraid of their losing their jobs and their abilities to provide for their families. And this vulnerability often fosters a resignation of riskless living and co-dependencies to others at work and at home. Blame and victimism. Every time you find a problem, you will usually find a finger point of blame. Society today is addicted of playing victim. If only my boss wasn't a controlling idiot. If only I hadn't been born so poor. If only I had lived in a better place. If only I had not inherited such a temper from my dad. If only my kids weren't so rebellious. If only other departments did not mess up my orders all the time. If only we are not in such a declining industry. If only my people weren't so lazy and without drive. If only my wife is more understanding. If only, if only. Now the children of blames are cynicism and hopelessness. When we succumb to believe that we are victims of the circumstances, we lose hope. We lose drive, and we usually settle in resignation and stagnation. Lack of life balance. In today's cell phone society, life is increasingly become a stressful, demanding, and absolutely exhausting. For all the effort we manage our time to do more, be more, to achieve greater efficiencies through the wonders of new technology, have we produced a balance and a peace of mind? In the last 50 years, the success literature is filled with image consciousness, with, so, with, with the quick fixes, with techniques, with social bandits and aspirants that address acute problems and sometimes appear to solve them temporarily, but left the underlying chronic problems unchecked. And these underlying chronic problems will fester and resurface time and again. Well, the truth is, our problems and the pains are universal and increasing. The solutions to our problems are and will always be based on common, universal, timeless virtues and the principles that are common to any enduring and prospering societies throughout history. Now, allow me to introduce to you an ancient civilization a culture that has endured 5,000 years, a culture rich with principles, virtues, and wisdom. Now, Chinese culture is different than Canadian culture. It is different than Western culture. Let me illustrate to, you, to my point with two paintings. Death of Socrates was a 1787 painting by a French painter, Jacques Louis Davis. It represents the death of Greek philosopher Socrates, condemned to death by drinking Hamlet. Now, also depicts here are his disciples, uh, the, the cradles sitting ruefully at the bed's end, and uh, Plato clutching the Socrates' knees. When you and I look at this painting, we see the same thing, and we interpret the same way. Socrates was offered two choices. One, exile. Second, death. And Socrates chose death. 
Every single square inch of the painting was filled with color and contents. There's no room for you to imagine otherwise. Water Buffalo by Chinese painter Karan Li is quite different. It is not picture-like. It is primarily black and white. And there's, as you notice, a lot of empty space on the, on, on the painting. There is not a single stroke of water, but in your mind, you can see water, can't you? And you can see how the water flows. You can imagine the season of the year, the time of the day. Some of you might imagine it is a uh, small village by the hillside in a lazy afternoon in the early summer. Some of you can even hear the birds singing, and some of you can even smell the scent from blossoming flowers. It is that different between Eastern and Western culture. Western culture is solid, is reasonable, is linear, is logical. Here's point A, here's point B, and you connect the dots. And that becomes the shortest distance between A and B. If you take a walk from A and keep walking towards B, if you keep walking, eventually you will get from A to B. It is logical. The path is obvious. It is the shortest distance between two points. But in Asian culture, it is not solid. It is abstract. Here is point A. Here is point B. That's it. And how do you get from A to B? There is not a shortest distance. There is not a logical path. And you have to figure out your own way. For example, you can, you can walk, you can drive, you can fly, or you can bend the space, touch an A, a and a B together, and punch a hole right through you can take a quantum leap. It is that different between two cultures. Now you may ask, how do I learn about Asian culture? Or how do I learn about any other culture? Plato said, here I quote, the things which we perceive as real are actually just shadows on a wall. Shadows on a wall. The things we see, the sound we hear, the scent we smell, these are what we perceive as real. They are just shadows on a wall. Shadows cast by what? Shadows cast by the real thing on the other side of the wall. And that real thing is the essence of the culture. And that real thing might be invisible to you, but it is real, it is there because it can cast shadows on the wall. Do not confuse the shadows with the real thing. Now in China, we have the very similar thing, almost identical. Xing er zhi shang zhe wei zhi dao, xing er zhi xia zhe wei zhi qi. Above the form and the shape is Tao. Below the form and the shape is container. The Tao, which is above the form and shape, might be invisible to you, but it is real. It is the essence of Chinese culture. And below the form and the shape, you can see, but it is just the container. Do not confuse the container with what it contains. So the key to understand another culture is to understand the essence of another culture. If you understand the essence of another culture, you understand everything. If you don't, you just simply don't get it. Now let me illustrate you again, this time with two movies. Mulan. Have you all seen Mulan? All right, my two children grew up watching uh, this animation movie produced by uh, Disney, Walt Disney. And before the production began, Disney sent their artists to China and other Asian countries to study the Great Wall and other landscape. They studied the facial features of Asian people. So all the characters in Mulan movie, they all look like Chinese, they talk like Chinese, they dress like Chinese, and Disney did a very good job about traditional Chinese couture. And the story of Mulan is based on the true story in Chinese history. 1500 years, 1500 years ago, a girl named Mulan joined the army on her father's behalf. She disguised as a man and fought the war for 12 years and became a general. True story. Now, for comparison, let's take a look at the second movie. You all see that, I assume. Kung Fu Panda. Now, Kung Fu, also called martial arts, is a very important component in Chinese culture. But panda, panda has nothing to do with martial arts in Chinese history, in Chinese culture whatsoever. 
Not only that, Panda is the only character that has connection with China. All the other characters, the Tai Longs, the Tigers, the Monkeys, the Master Wu Gui, Master Shifu. Now, Master Shifu is a Jedi master in the movie Star Wars. That is an American cultural icon. Now, the characters in Kung Fu Panda, they don't look like Chinese. They don't talk like Chinese. They crack in American jokes all the time. And they are voiced over by Jack Black, uh, Angelina Jolie, Dustin Hoffman, Hollywood's A-list actors and actress. And the story is total invention by Hollywood. It is not real at all. Now, tell me this. Which movie do you think that create cultural resonance? In other words, after watching these two movies, which uh, after watching that, the, the Chinese people or the Asian people will say, mm, 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 that is my culture, that is so Chinese, that is mine. Which movie do you think can do that? <laughs> Mulan. I see a lot of people say Mulan, but one panda. All right, minority wins. The answer is Kung Fu Panda. Now, why and why a movie look like Chinese, talk like Chinese, dress like Chinese, based on true Chinese story, did not create cultural resonance? And a movie totally opposite can do just that. The answer lies within the story, the philosophy, the values implied by these two movies. Now, in the Mulan's movie, uh, the Disney tells a story about a girl joined the army, on her father's behalf, a girl joined the army disguised as a man to try to prove her worthiness, equalness as a man. That is a fine virtue, but that is part of American culture. It is not what Mulan's story is all about. So it is actually telling American value with Chinese story. On the other hand, Kung Fu Panda telling, is telling Chinese or Asian story, Asian virtues, values with American story. Now, what are the Asian values we talk about? Number one, Panda is destined to be Dragon Warrior. On the day that Master Wu Gui is scheduled to pick from China's top martial artists for the next Dragon Warrior, Panda fall off the sky and drop right in front of the Master Wu Gui. And the Master Wu Gui pointing at the Panda say, that is our next Kung Fu, I mean, the, the Dragon Warrior to everybody's shock. Now, nothing happens randomly. Everything, everything happens with a reason. You are who you are today because you are destined to be who you are today. Everything you do has a consequence and they will shape your future life. Cause, effect, is called fate. Core Asian value. Second, how did Panda become dragon warrior? How did he achieve the status of dragon warrior? warrior. He opened the Dragon Scroll. That is a document that supposedly only be opened and read by the Dragon Warrior. And when Panda opened it, voila, it was blank. It was nothing. It is just full of empty space. Now remember the empty space in a Chinese painting? Here's point A, here's point B. You have to figure out how to get there. Here's where you are. The next is become dragon warrior. And you have to figure out there is not a logical way for you to get there. And the panda did just that. He figured out. He took a quantum leap. That's core Asian value. There is more. Martial arts, Kung Fu, is actually not about fighting. It is all about being a good man, or good person, and being a better person, and being a better person with a higher morality. And this process, this practice, to elevate your morality is called cultivation. And the Kung Fu is deeply rooted in cultivation practice in China. As a matter of fact, there are two primary Kung Fu style in China. Number one is called Shaolin. Shaolin is deeply rooted in the Shaolin Temple. They get their name from it. Shaolin Temple is a Buddhist temple that is a cultivation practice. And another style is called Tai Chi. It's founded by Zhang Sanfeng, and he's a Taoist cultivator. See, the Chinese martial arts actually is deeply rooted in the cultivation practice. There is more. Master Wu Gui, 
transform to flowers and ascend to sky. In ancient times, Chinese people believed that's how the people with high morality die. Actually, they, do, they did not die. They complete their journey on earth, they complete their cultivation, and they become immortal, and they ascend to heaven. Core Asian value, and there's more. Eventually, Master Shifu found his inner peace by getting rid of the, the attachment of anxiety. Core Asian value. So as you can see, you don't have to look like Chinese, dress like Chinese, talk like Chinese, but if you understand the essence of Chinese culture, you can be Chinese, every bit Chinese that you can imagine. If you understand the essence of another culture, the people from another culture will embrace you as one of their own. Now let's pause and think for a moment. What benefit can that bring to you in today's smaller world, in today's diversified society, in this information knowledge worker age? The benefit is huge. What success will you achieve if you reach that level of understanding of another culture? The sky is a limit. And the success of uh, Kung Fu Panda is evident by its sequel. There was Kung Fu Panda 2 last summer, and there will be Kung Fu Panda 3 next summer. And uh, no doubt, it will become a very, very successful franchise. Now you may ask, tell me this, what then is the essence of Chinese culture? Now in a nutshell, the essence of Chinese culture, the Chinese civilization is divinely inspired, it is cultivation based, it is a tradition of self-discipline and veneration for the divine. In a nutshell, that's the essence of Chinese culture. And one of the ancient names for China is the Celestial Empire. The Chinese people believe their magnificent civilization was a gift from heavens. So therefore, in ancient times, Chinese people believed the virtues such as truthfulness, compassion, integrity, tolerance, loyalty, filial piety. The Chinese people value these virtues are true throughout society. No matter who you are, you can be a farmer, a fisherman, a carpenter, or a government official. For example, before study, a scholar would meditate. A chef would take pure heart to making meals. And these virtues and the principles are the manifestation of the essence of Chinese culture. And these virtues and the principles come to life through legend, history, characters, and the stories. Stories told from father to son, from one generation to next. And that becomes part of traditional Chinese culture. Now, I have some bad news for you. The bad news is, understanding another culture is difficult. It is very difficult. And my, myself is a living example. I was born and grew up in China, and I came to the United States when I was 21 to attend college there. After I graduated, I settled down, I get married, I raised a family, I had two children, I have two children, and I watched my two children grow, and my girl just start her college this year. And I consider myself as a student of history. I read extensively about ancient Greek, Roman Empire, European history. I'm fascinated by American Civil War. I read the biographies of Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses Grant, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson. I visited the Civil War battlegrounds. For example, Lees, uh, in the uh, Boss Bluff in Leesburg, Manassas, Antietam, Chancellorsville, uh, Fredericksburg. I know more about American history than average American people. But I cannot, I cannot uh, claim that I know what's at the heart of American culture. I do not seem to get it. And uh, I do not know much about Canadian culture as well. But the same holds true for Canadian people to understand Chinese culture. Now the news will get worse in my next couple of slides. Actually, it will get much worse. This magnificent civilization is on the brink of extinction. We are living in the middle of a cultural dark age. 
In 1949, Chinese Communist Party came to power. The ideology of Communist Party is material, materialistic and anti-theistic. Not that they promote this class struggle, not the compassion and harmony among men and the nature as the traditional culture emphasizes on. In order to make room for its ideology, the party uh, systematically destroyed traditional culture and demonizing it as superstition. During Cultural Revolution, the party went on large scale of destruction of our cultural heritage, and most of our most treasured cultural relics were destroyed. For example, on the left is the pulling down of a uh, monument in Confucius' mansion. On the right is the uh, humiliation and the destruction of Confucius' statue. And unfortunately, this suppression and the destruction continues today. Yes, continues today. It becomes sophisticated though. The party no longer destroys the cultural relics these days. On the contrary, they promote Confucius institution inside China and overseas. But what the party promotes are the shadows on the wall. What the party promotes are the containers, not the essential of Confucius' teaching, which is the self-discipline and the veneration for the divine. Now, more than 60 years have passed since 1949, two generations. Many things can, be, can happen in two generations, and many things can be forgotten. Chinese people born after 1949 opened their eyes to a spiritual desert. They are no longer familiar with their own cultural heritage and the tradition. If Chinese people no longer recognize or understand their own culture, and this culture is literally on the brink of extinction. And when people walk, from, walk away from the, the uh, self-discipline and the veneration for the divine, bad things will happen. Actually, bad things have happened. Piracy, corruption are rampant in China. Respect and the protection of intellectual property is non-existence. Counterfeiting goods is fastly becoming a problem. As a matter of fact, China has become our number one source of counterfeiting goods. Fake drugs were sold to treat hypertension, diabetes, uh, skin diseases, and other complicated illness, including cancer. So you can see, this dark age is not only limited in cultural realm. This dark age is not only limited in China. It can affect you and your loved ones. Now, in, amazingly, amazingly, in this dark hour of the dark age, a hope emerged. Tradition has a magic way to staying alive in people's mind and heart, waiting to be awakened, waiting to be rekindled. The Renaissance of traditional culture is going on. It is creating momentum. It creates a rising tide that lifts all boats. And the Shen Yun performing arts is leading the way. And the Shen Yun performing arts is behind this tidal wave. What has lasted 5,000 years was once almost lost. Now, and the music show. It showcases the essence of 5,000 year civilization through classical Chinese dance, uh, original animated, original uh, live music, and a state of the art animated backdrop, and hundreds and hundreds of exquisite handcrafted costumes. Begin each year with all new programs. Shen Yun tours over 100 cities and reach more than 1 million audience members. And they will come to Mississauga in December, two months from now, for five shows. Now, the Shen Yun show, the Shen Yun show is about two and a half hours and consists of 20 different programs. And most of them are classical Chinese dance. And many are story-based. What you see here 
is the dance called Mulan joins the battle. It tells the story of China's most famous heroine, and the Mulan story is an example of China's two very ancient virtues: one, loyalty to your emperor; two, filial piety, the respect and the caring. For your parents, Mulan's story is of self-sacrifice as she took the place of her old and ailing father in the imperial army. Disguised as a man, she joined the battle and fought the war for twelve years and became a celebrated general. When the war is over, she received accommodation from her emperor, and no one knew they were fighting alongside with a girl. With a girl. Now, Shen Yun's version of Mulan gives in a dramatic but authentic retelling. Of our heroine's journey, unlike its Disney's counterpart, one of the、uh, unique feature of Shen Yun's show is the,、uh, the very innovative use of animated backdrop. And this dance is telling a legend that long time ago, once upon a time, there was there were nine suns appearing in the sky at the same time and scorching the earth. So God sent His general to take care of the problem. So when our hero let out his magical、uh, arrow fly, the fly hits the sun. The sun bursts into a fireball and it drops to the ocean. And it is very expressive in telling the story. You don't have to understand Chinese, but you will have no problem to understand the story in Shen Yun Show. Now, other than story-based、uh, the dance, Shen Yun also includes quite a few ethnic folk dance. What you see here is Mongolian bow dance. Mongolian people. Perform this kind of、uh, hospitality dance at the feast to encourage the guests to eat and drink more. So they tend to include a tableware in their dance. And I can assure you, those bowls are real. They are not something attached to the dancers here, because at the end of the dance, the dancers will disassemble the bowls and display them on the floor. And、uh, this is a fine example of、uh, Manchuria court dance. Manchuria people are the, from the Qing Dynasty. That is the last feudal dynasty in Chinese history. And、uh, from the from the、uh, the platform shoes to the costume to the tassel, the hairstyle, these are very well researched, very well designed, and handcrafted to fit to fit every individual dancers. Now Shen Yun. Is to build a bridge between culture, and I can think nothing better represented that、uh, than its orchestra. On its base, Shen Yun's Performing Arts Orchestra is a European-based orchestra. On top of which, they include a Chinese soloist to a great effect. On the left is the this instrument is called a pipa. It is a plucked-strum instrument, also known as the king. Of all China's folk music instrument, and on the le- right is the two.、Uh, it's called arhu. It's also named two-string violin. It has only two strings and the bow in between, so you can only play one note at any given time. You cannot play two notes at the same time. Now, despite this simplicity, arhu actually is very expressive. It can give the sound that is closest. It can give sound like a soul-stirring sound that is closest to a human voice. I have been watching Shen Yun show many times, probably close to 50 times in Opera House, Kennedy Center in Washington D.C. And every time, Ar Hu is playing. The entire Opera House, which can seat 2,000 people, the entire Opera House is dead silent, and you can hear a pin drop. It feels like everybody is is holding their breath. They try to listen to it that in- intensively. Now this is a picture of the Shen Yun Orchestra. As you can see, this is the Ar Hu soloist, and that is Pipa. It is very difficult, very difficult to combine the Eastern and the Western music instrument together because the same note played by the, the for example, Western flute and the Chinese、uh, the bamboo flute, the pitch and the tone is distinguishedly different. But somehow, Shen Yun artists combine them together and create harmony. It is truly, truly. Music to your ear. Chinese people, people in China, have long held that their magnificent civilization was a gift from the heavens. Art was primarily a means to explore the connection between human world and the higher universe. Artists. 
cultivated virtues because they believe in order to create art worthy of the divine, there must first be inner beauty and a purity. And Shen Yun follows that ancient tradition. Shen Yun artists believe that just mastering the surface of the art is not enough, as it is the heart of the artist that audience feel. Therefore, they take the wisdom and the values from traditional Chinese culture into their daily life. And these inspire them to nurture goodness in themselves on their path to artistic perfection. That is the culture of Shen Yun. Shen Yun artists not only demonstrate the virtues on stage, they live by them. That is why Shen Yun is world class. That is why Shen Yun is one of kind. That is why Shen Yun is the best, if not only way for you to truly understand, learn, explore, and eventually you will grasp the essence of Chinese traditional culture because Shen Yun will enable you to see through and beyond the wall, see what the real thing on the other side of the wall. Shen Yun will enable you to see through the container, see what the Tao is. That is what the container contains. It is that powerful. It is that beautiful. <laughs> Traditional Chinese dance requires someone to be very poised. It requires you to be very focused. Um, I think I'm pretty good at the control part because when I dance, sometimes even when I want to look at the mirror, I can't see myself. I don't know why my eyes just keep looking forward, but I don't see anything. I just see straight ahead. So maybe that's why I'm better at controlling and um, very focused, being focused. My mom wanted to sculpt me into someone who can present traditional values and someone very ladylike. So she sent me to learn all sorts of different kinds of things like pipa is a traditional Chinese instrument and she sent me to learn the flute and calligraphy and she also sent me to learn dancing which she hoped to help me have good posture when I grow up. It helps me in everyday life because I realized that all the traditional values that um, people were throwing away in, in uh, modern society right now are actually very important and you need them if you want to dance the Chinese dance well. It's not just something shallow, you really need something on the inside and deep understanding to be able to present something nice on the outside. So. Um, I started to learn more uh, how to act and dress more traditionally. I'm very happy to meet these young dancers here at Shen Yun because even though we all have very diverse personalities, we all value the same traditional values. I love it when we have uh, different parties or different activities like birthday parties. We already um, know each other so well that even on stage, we can feel each other. That's how we can be so together. Even with so many people, it all seems like one person dancing. When we dance, we are always conscious about people around us and to be the same and to have the same movements were amazing, you know, the, the way they just all worked together as one. It just, was just like looking like one object moving around, incredible. Not just the individual dancers, but for everyone to dance together to, to really perform so well as a group. I thought that was very impressive. Super, absolutely. <laughs> Just like how our MC says, every dance has its own unique meaning. You know, one single chopstick is easier to break than a bunch. Hence, people need to pull in their efforts together. Ah, uh, yes, just like on the harsh plains of Mongolia. Actually, this concept applies to every dance that we do. 
When I do an important role in a dance, and when I'm dancing with everyone else on the side, I don't feel any difference because um, if one person does well on a stage, it doesn't mean anything. What the audiences see is not just one person, they look at the whole picture. So everyone needs to do well, and we all know that. Even when, say, when one person is dancing, everyone behind me or on the side is supporting and encouraging me, and that helps me to do well, so it's everyone's strength. We just think about how to make our dancing better and how to be a better person and that helps us also on stage to be focused and present the right message to the audience. Beautiful, beautiful. Love the spirituality in it because it touched my heart. I, I could, it was a divine message there and the message was wonderful. Each of the dancers and the singers had that core, that groundedness themselves as the, so they were not just performing but actually living the message that they were dancing. That's, I, can, I can relate with those messages very much, so yeah, very hopeful. It was beauty for the eyes and beauty for the brain and beauty for the heart. So I'm walking away very inspired and um, full with optimism. I just feel like it's almost like being reborn and starting anew again in my life and letting go of a lot of pain and illusions. So that's when I felt very teary. I believe that art forms created with pure and clean intentions will radiate positive energy that can benefit the audience. audiences to get something out of our show to receive message and to realize that there's more beyond the materialistic things in life so even when they are depressed they can pull themselves through depressions or even bad situations and keep going in life I mean, no one can deal with change in life if there is not a changeless core inside them. The key to the ability to change is a changeless sense of who you are, what you are about, and what you value. Virtues are deep, fundamental truths, classical truths, generic common denominators. Virtues are bigger than people and the circumstances, and thousands of years of history have seen them triumph. Even more important, we can secure in the knowledge that we can validate them in our own life, by our own experience, by centering our life on the universal virtues and uh, principles. We created a fundamental paradigm of effective living. That is the source of wisdom, guidance, power, and security. Like the United States of Constitution is fundamentally changeless. In over 200 years, there had only been 26 amendments, and 10 of which were in the original Bill of Rights. It is a document that the US president agrees to defend and support when he takes the oath of allegiance. The Constitution has become the foundation and the base that enable people to ride through such major traumas, such as Civil War, Vietnam, or Watergate. The Constitution has endured and served its vital function today because it is based on correct virtues and principles, on self-evident truth contained in the Declaration of Independence. And these virtues and the principles empower the Constitution with a timeless strength, even in the midst of so social ambiguity and the change. Now, Thomas Jefferson, one of the America's founding fathers, said, I quote, our peculiar security is in the possession of a written constitution, end quote. Do I, do you, do we all have our own personal written constitution, a source of wisdom, guidance, power, and security? Now, I do not believe, I do not expect, I shall say, I do not expect that after you see the show, all your problems and the challenges will disappear. 
But if you see the show, and you will, if you see the show with open mind, I feel comfortable to assure you that you will gain new perspective. You will gain new perception. You will experience paradigm shift. You will gain new lens through which you see things in a new frame of thought. If you think differently, you will see differently. And if you see differently, you will act differently. And when you act differently, you will have a different set of consequences. And your life will be changed for good, of course. Cause, effect. Never failed to work. Now, I apologize. I keep saying it's a Chinese civilization, Chinese culture, Chinese virtue, Chinese principles. But think about it. Those virtues, such as Truthfulness, compassion, tolerance, integrity, fidelity, humility, justice, courage, bravery, so on and so forth. They are the wisdom and they are the virtues we all share. This is the, what mankind is based on. It just happened that China has validated them continuously for 5,000 years. It is our culture. It is our civilization. So let Shen Yun take you on to a journey to explore this divinely inspired 5,000 year history and the civilization. Let Shen Yun take you to a world where beauty and the purity have never been lost. Now we have been giving the same presentation in government agencies, corporations, in schools, clubs and the churches and uh, I hope that uh, you will share your experience you have today with your community. And we hope to introduce this magnificent civilization and a culture to as many Canadians as possible. And you are respected members of the community. And so I ask you to give us a chance, to give us a chance to bring this presentation to your organization and to your social gatherings. And I'm just asking each of you, each one of you, one chance. I think you should give it to me. All right? And, uh, and my colleagues, Rebecca, can you raise your hand? And she's uh, working in the help desk over there. So if you are willing to help us to open more doors, please talk to her and leave your contact information. And we will be more than happy, willing, and able to bring this presentation to your place. Thank you very much. Thank you.